Okay, so we'll uh, we'll carry on now with strut and tie analysis, which is covered in clause 6.5 of Eurocode 2, part 1.1. What we'll look at is, is just to start off with um, just some basic rules on modeling that the Eurocode sets out, because there are some restrictions on the way you can carry out your strut and tie analyses. Um, then we'll look at specifically the rules for detailing struts, ties, and nodes, and limiting stresses that we have for, for those regions. We'll look specifically at a, a special case of strut tie analysis called the partially loaded area rules, which are typically used for sort of designing bearing areas where we have confinement of the concrete around uh, the bearing area. And then we'll just finish up with a, one example, just, just showing how you, how you utilize the, uh, the rules in a typical situation. So there's a, a relatively short uh, clause um, in Eurocode 2 part 1.1 before we actually get into the main rules themselves for, for design in, in 6.4. Um, and this clause is in 5.64, and it really just sets out the background to strut and tie modeling and some of the restrictions uh, and I, on the idealization approach that you take. Um, it's worth pointing out that yesterday we were saying that plastic analysis is not allowed uh, for bridges other than accidental situations. Uh, and in fact, strut and tie modeling is basically a plastic analysis. Um, this is the exception <laughs> because the Eurocode specifically talks about strut and tie separately from plastic analysis. You can use strut and tie analysis in any situation. And you can also use it for ULS and SLS in any particular situation. Um, there are some situations where you have really no choice other than to use strut and tie analysis um, in the Eurocodes. And that's partly because in some situations it tells you to use it. So it basically says in areas where you have um, nonlinear strain, uh, and all these examples here are areas where we have nonlinear strain, and it says that we have to use strut and tie modeling to uh, assess the situation. And we also have to use it in some situations where there are no other rules given. So, for example, um, the top right situation here uh, could be representative of a pre-stressed anchor block. And it could be, a, could be a load on top of a pier, or it could be a pre-stressed anchor block. Um, there aren't any rules in the Eurocodes specifically covering pre-stressed anchor blocks. So if you want to do your bursting design, we haven't got a table um, of bursting forces like we had in BS500 that relate to sort of sizes of end plates and supporting areas. We have to work it out directly from a strut and tire model like this. You get, you get virtually the same answer because the strut and tire idealization was the basis for the table of BS500 Part 4 anyway. Um, but you have, to, you have to tackle it this way around. And in other situations, anything that creates nonlinear strain, as I say, the Eurocode says you have to, to use it. So that, that might be um, just the spread of load out on a leaf pier, uh, like the example here on the bottom left, or it might be that you have a, an access hole in an element and the, the flow of force goes round um, the access hole locally, and that generates some transverse tensions. Uh, basically, we have to design for those using strut and tie. Uh, the Eurocode will talk about D regions and B regions, uh, and these are really the means by which you start idealizing your structure. So by a D region, um, the Eurocode means uh, a discontinuity region, <coughs> D standing for discontinuity or sometimes disturbance. Uh, and then we also have B regions, uh, which B really standing for Bernoulli or Beam is another uh, definition. And we basically construct our um, struct ties by following the flow of force from the beam regions where we know we can predict the stresses just from beam theory um, back to the disturbance area. In, in all of these pictures here, the D regions are the shaded regions and you can determine the extent of the, the D region by working from the disturbance. So if for example we look at the top right one which is the, the example of a, a load on top of a pier or a pre-stressing anchor. If we work from the discontinuity and we come a distance away from that equal to the width of the section at the location where we have the discontinuity, then that basically defines um, the length of, uh, of, the, of the D region. So the depth there that we've come down is equal to B, equal to the width of the section. And the same applies, for example, for the situation with the hole. So we, the, the, the hole is the, the, the discontinuity. Um, the section width uh, at the location of the hole is, is width B. And if we come a dimension longitudinally B away, then that defines the end of the uh, uh, of the D region, and we're back into um, we're back into beam uh, theory. Uh, 
So a sort of simple example of how you construct a model uh, might be the case here on the right. So this, again, this, this could be the load on a, on a eccentric load on a pre-stress anchor block, or it might be just, a, again, a load on the edge of a pier. Um, the width of the section here is B. So if we come a distance away from the load equal to B, then that basically takes us into the beam region. And in the beam region at the bottom, we can calculate the stress distribution from sort of P over A plus M over Z type calculation. And that will give us a stress distribution um, like this. So we've basically got two triangular areas. One, one is a compression area, one's a tension area. And we can work from those two areas, um, from the tension area and from the compression area, we can work back and produce a sort of mechanism diagram like that by which the flow of uh, the forces can be carried. And there's a bit of learning to do with these. It, it, you, can, you can draw almost anything there and it would be an equilibrium, but there are some sort of rules and requirements um, that come up on the next slides. But what one of them is that when you end up with models like this, um, it's normal to end up with the internal lever arm equal to 0.5 times B, which is, which is why um, this node is located in the position that it's located in. This is just like something that you learn with a bit of practice, lever arms are, end up being 0.5B. So we could idealise it like that. Um, it just so happens that a better idealisation of that is, is the one on the left, um, where we've actually split the compression zone up into two struts. And you can't possibly know that without some practice and without looking at like standard examples of, of where these models have been derived. There's nothing wrong with the one on the right, but it actually overestimates the tension in the top um, in the top tie, and the model at the bottom is a, is a better uh, idealization. So the Eurocode basically says, well, yeah, okay, there, there, there are an infinite number of ways you could idealize this with different angles, but actually we do need to play by some um, basic rules. And the reason, one of the reasons for that is that concrete does have limited ductility. So in the same way as when we do the shear truss model, we have to stick with our truss angle between 45 degrees and 21.8 degrees. That's just simply because the concrete wants to behave initially um, in however it's, it wants to behave prior to cracking in its elastic uh, state. And once you get cracking, then these struts will rotate round to suit where you put the reinforcement. But there's a limit to how it can do that before you, the concrete will sort of crack and just lose its compressive strength excessively. So we have to have some limitations of angles that you can put on uh, on struts. And the Eurico makes it a reasonably unhelpful statement, but it basically says that what you should try and do is follow the, uh, follow the flow of force in an elastic analysis, which is kind of basically implying um, you need to do some sort of like finite element calculation of the, of the area to find out where the elastic stress trajectories are going and then make a strut and tie model to suit that. There's some merit in doing that, <laughs> because if you've done an, a, a Shell FE model, it's still actually very difficult to process the results from that and actually using a strut and tie model following that is, is easier but generally you're trying to do a strut and tie model because you don't want to do a computer model and therefore you need kind of simpler um, rules to follow. I like the one at the bottom uh, here as a bullet as, a, as, a, as probably the best guide. Um, generally if you make the um, the angles between the, the struts and the ties between 45 and 60 degrees then you've pretty much got a well conditioned model. So that's probably the best guidance. And I think you find most of these, you know, we have actually satisfied that at 45 degrees between the strut and the tie, uh, with the exception of the, the model down the bottom right here uh, of, the, of the system going past this access hole. Um, that wasn't deliberate to make those, the angles between the struts and ties here about sort of 70, 80 degrees. Uh, I think they started off at 60 degrees, but the figures got distorted over the passage of time. Um, and it's, 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 it, these angles have got kind of smaller and smaller. So uh, basically the lever arm here between the compression and the tension is too big. It should, have, it should be made smaller to, so that the angles between the struts and ties fit within the 45 to 60 degree uh, limit. There's another test um, which the Eurocode specifically mentions, but again, it's not very practical. And I, I don't think I've actually ever done it myself to check how good a model is. Um, but it says basically that the the best model is one which minimizes the strain energy within the model. So what you could do if you've got a whole, well, we take the, the model on the bottom left, we could, we could do lots of different incarnations of that with different, different angles for the, for the compression. Um, 
if we actually basically look at each of the components, the struts and ties, and sum up what the energy is in each of those, so we, we do our little static analysis, we work out all the forces are in each of the components, um, we then work out what the strain energy is from the stress in each of the elements, we can basically sum up the, the strain energy in all of those components, and the model that has the lowest total strain energy is the best model. But as I say, it's not really a very practical means of doing things. Um, the other thing you'll find if you do if you do actually put numbers to it, you'll find that the, the strain energy in the, all the compression struts, um, by comparison with the strain in the reinforcements, is very very small. So when you do actually start doing the model, you can kind of pretty much ignore the strain energy in the concrete and just look what the strain energy in the uh, in, in the uh, reinforcements are. So that's just some sort of general modelling principles. Um, Strut and tie is nothing new. People have been doing strut and tie for ages, for years. But I think what 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 we haven't been doing in industry is doing it consistently. So we've all we've all done our models and we've all sort of checked struts uh, and ties and nodes to stress limits that we've just kind of made up or we've found from a textbook or something or anyone. But we've all done things kind of differently, sometimes safe and sometimes unsafe. So what what the Eurocode does add to all of this, apart from a bit of general information on how to go about modelling things, is some specific limits that we have to work to when we're designing the struts and the ties and the nodes. And starting off with um, struts, there are basically two limits that the code uh, gives you. The top limit is really intended for situations where you've, you've just got pure compression in an element and you've either got no transverse tension at all or you might even have some beneficial transverse clamping compression. And in that situation, the stress limit for the strut is basically FCD, which is the same as the stress limit that you have for designing beams for flexure. If you remember back to yesterday, um, FCD has in it a definition, or, or it has it as its definition alpha CC times FCK divided by gamma. Um, the Eurocode itself says alpha CC is 1 for shear and 0.85 for bending and compression. Um, and it doesn't tell you what it is in a whole range of other situations, and that's the recommended value. So the, Euro, the, the UK National Annex uh, actually tells you what to use in each situation. Because we want compatibility in this case here with beam design, then we have to use alpha CC as 0.85, because that's what we have to use for when designing beams for bending and axial force. The second um, strut limit is basically intended for uh, struts which are in compression but which have some transverse tension. And that can be a transverse tension that's actually physically applied through the reinforcement. Or it might be a transverse tension that just arises because the strut itself is trying to expand out sideways and creates its own tension. So a good example of this sort of situation is actually going back again to the shear truss model. When, when, when we're... Uh, when we're working out what VRD max is for a section, what we're effectively doing is checking crushing of the diagonal struts. And when we're checking crushing of those diagonal struts, we have to bear in mind that we have shear reinforcement passing through the struts, which are actually tending to rip the strut apart. So in actual fact, this strut stress limit here, or strut limit here, is, is the one that's used for the derivation of the shear truss model. And for compatibility with that shear truss model, uh, because when we do shear design, um, we have to use alpha CC equals 1. When we're checking this strut limit, we have to have alpha CC equals 1 in the definition of SRD max. So you can already see this is getting messy <laughs> and confusing. We're talking about the same thing here, strut and tie analysis, and we've got a different value of alpha CC and two strut limits. Um, it's not really ideal, but that's, that's the reason why it comes about. We have to do that to maintain compatibility. Otherwise, if we try and work out the shear resistance of, a, of something from first principles using a strut and tie model, we'll get a different answer um, to what we have from the code rule. This second limit is um, it's, it's a bit uh, conservative. It, although, although it's shown there with, or, with a, an orthogonal tension, um, the worst case is actually not orthogonal tension like that, but actually skew tension, because then the compression has to pass across cracks which are skewed. Um, if the cracks actually run parallel to the compression strut, it's not so bad, 
situation. So if you really do truly have this situation of tension applied orthogonally to the, the compressive strut, then this stress, stress limit is a bit conservative. And the Eurocode says you can do something else that's less conservative, but it doesn't tell you what. So basically you can't really, unless you go, go off and do some research or find some textbooks. Um, ties are pretty straightforward. Um, a tie can be a piece of reinforcement or it can be a piece of pre-stressing steel. Um, because we can design to uh, or use strut and tie analysis for ULS and SLS, when we're coming to check our limiting stresses in the, in the ties, then it obviously depends on what limit state we're checking. So at the ultimate limit state, we can just work the steel up to its full yield strength. Um, if we're using this method of calculation for serviceability, then we will need to work it to a lower stress corresponding to the crack width that we're allowed. And for reinforced concrete, as, as um, Jessica will be telling you later on, um, generally the crack width we have to design for is 0.3 millimetres. So if you're doing a, a strut and tie model at serviceability, you basically look up from a table what your allowable stress is for that particular bar size and bar spacing for a 0.3 millimetre crack width, and then you'd have to use that in your uh, check of strut and tie. Um, the Eurocode talks about two different types of ties, discrete ties um, and smeared ties. A discrete tie is basically where you put the reinforcement down precisely at the location of where you've idealized the tie in your analysis. So if you've got something like this situation here, a deep beam, or it might be a pile cap um, base, and we've, we've drawn out our strut tie analogy uh, or model like this, and we've got some a tie at the bottom there, if we put our reinforcement basically at that location, or, or very close to that location, um, then that's basically a discrete tie. If we've got a, a situation more like the bursting situation here, where our, our flow of forces um, we deviate over actually quite some significant height, um, but we idealize that flow of force as a single tie at the center of the tension zone, then what we should do, we shouldn't actually put one discrete tie at that location because we're actually we've got tension over a considerable height. So what we should do, although we've calculated um, the tensile force at that location from a simple model, we need to distribute um, the reinforcement over the whole tension zone, uh, which in this case is 60% of the uh, of the depth of the beam or the depth of the section there. And this particular situation, the Eurocode actually gives it a name. It calls it a partial discontinuity. Um, and there's a formula there, which is pretty simple, not difficult to derive from the, from the from the diagram, but it gives you a formula there for what the tension is, and that, that's basically the, the expression you'd use for, for sizing up your bursting steel you know, in a primary prism. Um, it also talks about uh, something called a full discontinuity, and this is just basically where the uh, the length of the member is, is, is sufficiently short, so that the, the load hasn't got time to spread out across the full width of the section before it sucks back in again. Um, to a force on the opposite opposite face. And for that situation, again, we can draw a strut and tie model, like shown there, that gives you the, the tensile forces from the splitting. Um, but there's a slightly different formula that goes with it, which the Eurico provides you. It's just worth mentioning that um, generally, when we're checking sort of struts and ties, you can't just ignore, when you're checking a strut, you can't just ignore the fact that the, 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 the um, load is going to spread out. So what we shouldn't do in that right-hand situation is just pretend that this spread of load doesn't happen and just pretend we have a strut that goes down vertically and then use the, uh, the stress limit for no through tension because that isn't strictly safe. We, we actually we need to use the, the version that, of, of stress limit that has um, through tension. There is an exception to that if we've got partially loaded area conditions, but, but generally if we've just got sort of Plain, plain stress like this, and that there's no constraints to the other faces, then we have to use that lower stress limit. Um, nodes covered by clause 6.5.4. Um, it defines a node just as a volume of concrete containing the intersections of the struts and ties. And there's a bit of science, or a bit, a bit of art rather, probably, in, in, in sizing up your nodes. Um, which only really comes with practice, to be honest, but they're generally dictated just by the geometry of the incoming struts and ties. Um, as you can see on the sort of simple example, 
uh, over on the left hand side those, those nodes are really just uh, sized as a function of the, of the angles of the, of the strut and tires that we've got. Um, there's a principle which basically says it's a pretty obvious principle but it's actually surprisingly easy to not comply with um, which is that the nodes must be detailed so that they're in equilibrium. It's pretty obvious but as I say it's actually quite easy to mess that up. If you've got three forces coming into a node then that equilibrium condition is basically that the three forces must pass through a common point. If you've got more than three forces that isn't necessarily the case. And so if you've got models that are made up of sort of nodes with three forces or four or five forces, then you do have to be a bit careful because you may end up with some nodes where all the forces don't actually get node into a single, a single point and it will still be an equilibrium. As a general rule, it's better to try and make sure that all the forces do go into one single point. And sorry, I'll just, just before we move on to the next slide, you've got the same distinction between um, discrete nodes and smeared nodes as we have the ties. So... If you have a discrete tie, then you're going to end up with a discrete node, as we have in this, this bottom left situation. If we have smeared ties, then we're going to end up with smeared nodes. And if you have smeared nodes like that, then we don't need to perform any particular specific calculation of the stress in those nodes, as you'll see from the following slides. Um, what we do just have to do is make sure that the bars are sufficiently anchored beyond the points at which you're assuming them to be effective. So... What we'll find is that there are three different node types identified with different stress limits. And the stress limit depends on how much transverse tension we've got passing through the node, weakening the concrete. So the first type of node that the, the, uh, the ERICO defines is a, is a CCC node, where C stands for compression. So this is basically the, the example at the top here is compression, compression, and compression coming into one single node. And that might be... Um, for example, representative of the bearing area and internal support. So we've got we've got the vertical force from the bearing, and then we've got the truss model, <coughs> the shear truss model, the struts coming into the to the bearing each side. And indeed, the Eurico basically says if no other rules apply, i.e., like the partial loaded area rules, which we'll talk about in a minute, if no other rules apply, then you have to use these struts, uh, these node limits, when you're sizing up your bearing areas for things like beams um, and on columns. So this this in the absence of any other rule, that would be this would dictate your allowable bearing pressure when you're designing your bearings. Um, I mean this, this also could be representative of a, of a, a corner uh, joint like we've got at the bottom here uh, under closing moment. Basically, the, the, um, there's, there's a useful sizing guide, um, which I can't remember whether this is actually in the Euro code or not, but it, it, it's, it's good practice. It's what, what you actually try to do when you're sizing up a node like this, is to get hydrostatic pressure on the on the faces of the node as a as a real ideal. Um, so what we what we try and do is, is get is set the dimensions of these and the forces such that the pressure on that face is the pressure on that face is the pressure on this face. Uh, but that isn't always achievable because I say often it's um, often you just have to live with the geometry you end up with the struts coming in, um, and so you can still use this limiting stress for this node, providing that the, the pressure on the adjacent faces doesn't differ by more than a factor of two. If it, if it does differ by more than a factor of two, then you need to uh, do something else, <laughs> re re reconfigure your model. But anyway, the CCC node basically has the highest allowable pressure of the three nodes, and we, we have um, a, a pressure of K1 times nu dash times FCD. And K1 has a recommended value of 1.0, um, which we also adopt in the Eurocodes. We've then got um, a CCT node, and this is basically stands for compression, compression tension. So this might be representative of a node at the simply supported end of a beam. We've got the vertical bearing reaction, we've got the again the truss um, compression field coming in, and then we've got the reinforcement that's anchored off at the end of the, the beam. And because we've got transverse tension now passing through the node because of the reinforcement, we have a slightly lower stress limit. We have to use 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.85 times nu dash times FCD. Nu dash is um, uh, 1 minus FCK over 250. I think it typically comes out as about 0.85 itself. And there's some other, there's some other sort of general um, rules and requirements for these types of nodes. Um, most of them are pretty obvious. So, for example, we've got to make sure that the bars... Um, 
are fully anchored beyond the face of the of the node that we're designing. Otherwise, that they, they won't be able to act to their full um, full design force. You'll also find that um, the more layers of reinforcement you put in here, which isn't necessarily convenient because normally we just want one layer of reinforcement, but the more layers of reinforcement you put in, um, the bigger the node area actually becomes when you draw it, and therefore the less critical the node becomes. And the Eurocode often talks about good, de good detailing, being putting things in multiple layers. Um, I wouldn't pay too much attention to that. I'll just carry on detailing things the way that contractors want us to detail things. And then the last node is a CTT node, compression, tension, tension. This only really um, applies to this sort of situation here where we've got a force coming into the bend of a bar. Um, and because we've got tension passing through in two directions through the node, that weakens the node more than the other two types of nodes. So we've got the lowest um, stress limit here of all of the node limits, 0.75 times new dash times FCD. Um, it's not necessary when you're detailing one of these to make the, the compression strut come in at 45 degree or bisect the bar, the bend exactly. You, it can come in at any angle. Um, all that happens is if, the, if you bisect the bend exactly, all the force is transmitted directly in bearing to the bars. If you come in at a slightly um, skew angle to, the, to, the, to bisecting it perfectly, then some of the load goes in bearing on the bars and some goes in bond along the bars. But the, the stress limit that you're allowed to use is still the same. The other thing we've got to do um, in this situation here is we also have to actually check the pressure on the concrete that the, the bar imparts on the uh, on the concrete. So the, in the in the section on detailing, there's a, a simple formula for that, and it's really the same as we used to do in BS 500. Because what we're doing here is we're checking the stress in the concrete across the full width of the section. We're not checking the bearing pressure of the bar itself on the concrete. And that's why we've got two checks to do. And it then mentions in the, in the, in the code that we've got um, the possibility of increasing any of those um, compressive stress limits by 10% if we comply with any of the following uh, bullets. And the reality is the only one that's actually possible or, or easy to demonstrate is the second bullet. Um, if we've made sure that all the angles between struts and tyres are greater than 55 degrees, then that's like a you know, tick. It's quite easy to demonstrate that. The others are a bit more nebulous. So, for example, if we can assure triaxial stress state, how would you do that? It's very difficult to, unless you've actually got pre-stressing sort of in a ring or something around constraining everything, it'd be difficult to demonstrate that. Um, stresses applied at supports or point loads are uniform and the node is confined by stirrups, but it doesn't have any detailing requirements for what that stirrup would look like. So again, that's quite tricky. It doesn't just mean stick a few links in and, uh, and you're fine. Reinforcement is arranged in multiple layers. Um, it doesn't tell you how many how many is multiple, so I don't know whether it's two or three or four, um, and then the node is reliably confined by means of bearing arrangement or friction. Again, again it's, just, it's just, it's a nice idea, I know where it's coming from, but it's, it's practically too difficult to actually demonstrate you're doing any of these things. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about before just quickly doing the example is the partially loaded areas. Um, this is basically a, a special case um, of strut and tyre. So you, you'll see this same diagram again of, a, of something that looks like a bursting area. But this is really intended whereby the dimension of the load is smaller than the supporting area in both dimensions. So in, in, the, in, the, in the transverse direction that we're looking at on the screen, but also in a direction into the screen as well. So there's going to be concrete all the way around, not just in one, in one plane. And in those situations, the code tells us that we have to check crushing of the concrete in the area right under the supporting load and also then bursting further away from the, from the support. And there's a formula given for the, what the, uh, the maximum force that you can carry there in, in an area like this where we have concrete all around the loaded area and it's, it's the one here, it's FRDU is equal to uh, AC naught which is the, the loaded area times FCD times um, root of the ratio AC1, which is the supporting area, divided by AC0. And the supporting area is supposed to have the same shape as the, the loaded area. And obviously, if we look, look down in plan, the supporting area must physically fit on the uh, available concrete. So that's generally the, the, what defines the, uh, the limitation on the supporting area. 
And if we do that, we can, we can again enhance bearing uh, pressure at way, way above FCD, but we mustn't take it greater than three times um, FCD. So that's, that's, the, that's the practical limit. What's actually happening in this, the reason we're able to, to generate these higher um, pressures is that if we have concrete all around the supporting area, as we, as we press down on the concrete, the concrete tries to expand and it tries to expand against a ring of concrete acting all the way around the loaded area. And that concrete can provide basically containment until you stress it so hard that you reach its cracking strength. So the, the derivation of this, I wouldn't say it works perfectly, uh, but the, 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 the theory behind this is that you look at um, for these different geometries, you look at the annulus of concrete around the loaded area, you work out its tensile capacity acting in, in sort of ring tension, and then you can work out what confining stress that applies to the concrete. Right at the start of Eurocode 2, there is um, a section in, in section 3 which tells you how the strength of the concrete is enhanced by varying amounts of transverse confinement pressure. So effectively you then, you're effectively then going back to that section, working out what the confining pressure from the, from the tensile concrete surrounding the loaded area is, and enhancing the, the vertical resistance that you can have up to a limit of three times FCD. If you were to... Um, if you were to dispense with, with considering the tensile strength of the concrete and you actually put pre-stressing in a ring around the loaded area, then you could go up to pretty much, I wouldn't say any, any value you like, because you get, at some point you'll end up with a sort of failure wedge mechanism, which isn't covered by these rules. But you, you could end up generating greater confinement pressures and therefore greater vertical forces. So if you use this, as long as you've got concrete surrounding you in your bearing areas, then you can get quite a lot higher pressures than you would do out of the other rules for nodes we've been looking at. So we've got to, we've got to, uh, we've got to define, we've got to design the, the spalling region at the top and that can give us much greater pressures. And this, this is essentially what manufacturers of pre-stressing anchors do when they have their, their end plates. This is, this is basically the rules that they design. Um, that's how you get the very high pressures. But we've still got to check bursting ourselves in the zone away from the, the, from the anchor. And we can do that either by um, physically putting in bursting reinforcement or the code does allow us to utilize the tensile strength of the concrete to resist the splitting forces as well. So I mean, coming back to this, this situation here where we, we idealize the, the expanding um, flow of struts as, as a transverse tension, and we, we can use the formula early on to work out what that, uh, that tensile force is. It's the expression here, quarter uh, B minus A over B times F. We can either put in tension for that, or, or we can actually check whether the concrete in this, this height of 0.6b is able, working at its design tensile strength, to resist that splitting force. Uh, if we do that, then we, we get the formula at the bottom of the page here. F max is basically the maximum pressure applied at the loaded area. And that's limited by um, the geometry of the structure. So A is the loaded width, B is the supporting width, um, and FCTD is the design tensile strength of the concrete, which we get from table, I think it's table 3.1, again back at the start of Eurocode 2. If we plot out that what that formula looks like um, for different um, B over A dimensions, you'll see that it, uh, it takes up the form there. So we have a, a minimum at uh, a B over A of 2, and then it goes up to an infinite value as B over A um, tends to 1 and also as B over A tends to infinity. Um, what, what's happening there is, as B over A tends to 1, the supporting width B becomes equal to the, um, the width A, and all these stress trajectories just become vertical, so there is no transverse tension. The fact that, this, the fact that, that diagram goes up to infinity doesn't mean that you can stress it to infinity, it just means that the check of bursting is no longer a critical check, but we still have to check the pressure under the loaded area, the spalling check that we did previously. And then similarly, if we have um, B over A becomes enormous, so we, we, we've got um, a small loaded area in an absolutely vast expanse of concrete. Well, there's just so much concrete there to resist the splitting forces generated that it won't split. Um, but again, that's only one half of a check. That's just the bursting check. We still have to check the pressure underneath the, 
the loaded face, and we in that situation would be limited to the three times FCD, basically as a, as a maximum. The last thing I'll mention, um, which is not really strut and tie, but it's um, it, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of needed in the same cases, if you like, when you're analysing peers, um, is something that's in Annex J of Eurico 2 Part 2. And I, I must confess that opinion is somewhat divided as to whether this is really necessary or is a real problem. Um, it doesn't seem to be particularly well supported by tests and is, is rather conservative. But it's a sliding um, wedge failure mechanism which the Eurocode requires you to consider. And this is really trying to pick up the situation of putting a bearing on a leaf pier too close to the edge. And what this is saying is if you've got a load um, on the edge of the section, um, then we have to look at a, a wedge coming out with an angle theta. And theta is not a variable this time. Theta is fixed at 30 degrees. Um, that wedge basically defines the amount of horizontal reinforcement we have in, in that height. And we have to provide horizontal reinforcement such that we can carry over that height um, a force equal to half the bearing reaction. The new build, that doesn't seem to be much of a problem. Um, because normally the, the sort of reinforcement, provided you don't put this thing right on the edge of the, of the section, um, the, the sort of reinforcement that you have to put in for early thermal cracking, typically sort of T20s at 150 or something like that, will be enough reinforcement to cater for this case. It's not so great for um, historic structures when you start assessing things, and th th this is one of the areas where the Eurocode gives you a problem, because you might want to use the Eurocodes to use strut and tie on something, but then you have to sort of cherry pick because you don't want to do this, because <laughs> um, you may well demonstrate that there's a, there's a problem in certain areas. So I don't particularly like this. I think if you can, if you can, if you can draw a strut and tie diagram out, um, whereby, for example, this uh, this top load is held in place at source by some heavy transverse reinforcement at the top, such that the load can't move sideways. To me, that is a perfectly acceptable solution. Um, but there's still some arguments about that. So at the moment, if we're doing new design, we're going to have to comply with this rule because that's what it says. Um, just to finish up um, on this one, just a, just a really quick sort of walkthrough example. Um, we use these rules, um, it must be about eight, eight years ago now, in their draft format when we were designing the Medway Bridge. Uh, because we had this situation here where we diaphragms at the supports. It's a, it's a two-cell box girder. Uh, sitting on two uh, piers, separate piers, and we had some rather large access doorways um, at the diaphragm, and that made it pretty much impossible to try and design it by beam theory. Uh, we did have a go initially, sort of designing as a plane frame, but you get all sorts of horrible Virendil type bending effects around the hole, and you end up just trying to stuff, stuff these areas up, up above and below um, the access holes with lots of links and things, and it was just the wrong solution. So we, we, we stood back from the problem and used strut and tie analysis, which is after all now what the Eurocode is saying you should be doing. You shouldn't be trying to treat it as a beam. It doesn't behave that way. So this was the idealization we came up with. We had, we had um, we got the loads, basically the shear loads being suspended down from the webs uh, onto the bearings and at the, from the middle web we have to suspend load up on a tie over the doorway and then back down on a compression strut to the, uh, to the bearings. So the first thing we have to do is a statically determinate system. Um, for a particular load case, we had to analyze the, the section. And uh, from that, we need to work out the forces in the struts A, B, and the tie C and D. And for the particular load case we were actually looking at, uh, although we've drawn the tie D here at the bottom as a tie, <laughs> uh, it actually turns out to be in compression under this particular uh, uh, load case. Um, I mean. Uh, in trying to work out why that's happening, it's actually useful to go back to pretending it's a beam. If it's a beam, we've basically got a beam on two supports. We've got a mid-span uh, load that's, that's generating a sagging moment, if you like. And then we've got two sort of cantilevering forces creating a hogging moment through the whole span. And it just happens in this load case that the hogging moment generated by those two outer forces is bigger than the sagging moment generated by the inner load. And hence the whole portion of, of, of tie D actually became in, in compression. So that was the overall um, that was the overall uh, idealization. We we then um, split it up 
in, into a bit more detail to actually size the, 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 the nodes um, themselves. We wouldn't normally draw these sort of struts bottling out like that. You just normally just draw them parallel, but they've just been drawn bottling out just to show that that's what's going to actually physically happen, um, which will then inform the decision of which strut limit to use because they're creating transverse tension by expanding outwards. So the first thing we have to do is, is check the, uh, the bearing pressure here. We've, and we've used the CCC uh, node type to check the, the bearing pressure at the bottom here. And the limiting stress for, for, for that is uh, K1 times nu dash times FCD. That gives us an allowable pressure of 19 megapascals on the bearings. And the actual stress, um, given the size of the bearing, was only 9 megapascals, so a lot smaller than the applied and the allowable. Um, we then need to check strut A coming out from the, from the bottom there. Um, we should do two checks, really. We, we should check the bottom of strut A as it actually comes into the node, and then we should check the remainder of the strut. But because the, the force at the node and in the strut is the same, and the strut limit itself, where we have, exp where we have transverse tension created by the, the bulging effect, um, the, the limitation for the strut itself is actually a smaller limiting stress than for the node. So there isn't actually any point checking the force on the node itself. We get to go straight into checking the, the strut. So the limiting stress for the, for the strut is the 0.6 um, new dash times FCD, which comes out as 13.4, uh, and the actual stress in the strut, and we have, to, we, have to, we have to check it at the minimum dimension, which is the 1400 mil here at the node, um, basically gives us an applied stress in that strut of 8.6, so that, that strut works as well. We have to do the same thing for strut B. So again, we'd have to check, in theory, the node. But as I said, the node has a higher stress limit than the strut. Um, so then we'd have to check the strut itself just above the node. But in this particular case, uh, what we found, the presence of the doorway means that the strut actually has to bottle in. Uh, we, we've, got, we've got a center line here of the, of the compression force, which is determined by the location of these bent-up bars. So the width of the strut itself is then fixed by being equal to twice the distance from the center line to the nearest point on the doorway. And that 750 millimeter dimension there is actually smaller than the equivalent dimension down at the node at the bottom. So that becomes a critical point to check. And again, so the, the limiting stress is 13.4, and the actual stress at that um, next section of the doorway is 10.06. And as an aside um, here, we realized when we were starting drawing these diagrams out that it was incredibly sensitive to where you put that bend of the bar at the top to precisely what that dimension of the doorway was going to be, which didn't feel overly comfortable when you're then relying on the contractor to fix things sort of precisely in the right location. So we did flag this up on, on the drawings that there was actually a specific need for, to, be, to, to position these bars within, I can't remember what tolerance we said, but basically within a tolerance and to let us know if it wasn't possible to achieve that. Because it, it, it is possible to move this across just a little bit and the, the, the strut will go entirely through the doorway and just won't work at all. So sometimes you need to be aware of the, <laughs> the sensitivity of your model to, uh, to minor fluctuations. Um, we also have to check then the, the node at the top um, there. In this particular case, we've got the, um, the CTT node, and the stress limit for a CTT node is still greater than the actual limiting stress for the strut by, by a small amount. Um, it's 14.3 compared to the 13.4 before. And we've just conservatively here used the same stress in the strut at the next section, but it would have been possible to use a slightly wider um, strut width. last thing we have to do is, is design the tie, and that's the easy bit, because um, all we do to design the tie is, is, is get the force from our calculation in the tie and divide it by the design yield strength, 500 divided by 1.15 for, for gamma S, and that gives us a steel uh, area of 31,510 uh, millimeters squared, which equates to 26 number 40 diameter bars, which, <laughs> which yes, the contractor did enjoy putting into the tolerances that we asked him to put him in, into. But, I, th I think he would have enjoyed putting in all the links from a sort of a beam, a beam theory approach even less, because it, it just would have been Im impossible to do it, frankly. 